Welcome to Economics. This is Dr. Kling, and we're continuing our discussion of consumers and producer surplus, and this time we're going to talk about how what happens with a tax in consumers and producer surplus. So once again, and let me have a nice big supply and di demand diagram, because this is it's going to be a lot of points to label here, so we'll put a supply curve up, we'll put a demand curve up, and then we'll <coughs> put a tax in with a dashed line. Maybe I'll put in a different color, see if it'll show up. Uh, what would be a good color? Try white. Okay, so this is our so we add a tax onto the price. So this is the supply with a tax that raises the price. Okay. And okay, so we need a to label a bunch of points. Let's go there and then I'm going to go back to yellow there. Okay, and so let's think of some points. We have A, B, C. I'm not sure I'll need D, E, F, G. Okay, all sorts of possible points here. So the original consumer surplus is A, C, G. The original producer surplus is C, E, G. Um, <coughs> the new consumer surplus, I'll call prime, uh, that's after the tax, is going to be A, B, F, because they um, there's a, the, there's a lower quantity uh, that's traded in the market, and then the, it's at a higher price. The producer surplus, the producer only gets the difference between, the, the producer only gets, let me drop down to what the producer gets. The producer only gets this much. Okay, so I'm going to have to go over, create a new letter, I guess, H. So the producer surplus, <coughs> when the tax is put in place, will be, you know, call that I, will be EHI. So this triangle here. Then this rectangle, B, F, H, I, will be the tax revenue. So the tax revenue equals B, F, H, I. So that you produce, let's say, up to F units of output, and then the tax is the <coughs> distance from the supply curve with the tax to the actual supply curve, that's B minus H, so <coughs> that's our revenue, B, F, H, I. Um, so I'm implicitly assuming that the, the tax is sort of a fixed dollars per unit, not a percentage tax. Um, so we can measure this vertical distance in dollars. And then there's a, a lost consumer surplus of the triangle FIG. Okay, so that's that triangle FIG is <coughs> is just is the dead weight loss. Nobody gets that. So the government so consumers and producers both lost surplus, the government got some of that in revenue, if 
from that rectangle, but because there's less traded, you're, you're not trading as much as the suppliers are willing, the suppliers would be willing to, to offer it prices down here, and the um, and the consumers are willing to, to buy at prices up here, but they're prevented from doing it, and so that triangle is the deadweight loss of taxes. So um, some an economist named Martin Feldstein, a, uh, a renowned economist at Harvard, is, is known for estimating the, uh, the loss of uh, the deadweight loss from various taxes in the economy, and he thinks that the deadweight loss overall is quite high. Of course, you know, we do, you know, it's a reasonable argument that we need to collect taxes. Uh, the question is, is there a way to minimize the deadweight loss from collecting taxes? And in fact, there is. If you were to tax <coughs> goods that have inelastic supply and demand, uh, supply or demand, but uh, ideally both. Uh, let me let me just do in, a very inelastic demand, and uh, well, I guess I've got to have the demand at some point. Uh, let me let me get rid of these guys. Hang on, got to at some point have the demand hit the hit the axis. Okay, so supply, demand. Now, if the government puts a tax on, the triangle of loss is really pretty small. Be and it's small because the demand is inelastic. You don't as long as you don't change the quantity mu much. So this the moral of the story is if you you don't change the quantity much there's <coughs> only a small loss in surplus. So you get you get a big redistribution in terms of you can get a lot of tax revenue so you get a lot of revenue, relatively speaking, and very little loss in surplus. And of course, if you have an inelastic supply, that uh, even if the demand is elastic, if the supply is inelastic, again, you don't get much of a, of a change in quantity. So the moral of the story is you should tax things with inelastic demands and supplies. So ag examples of things with inelastic demand would be things like cigarettes, um, gasoline, things like that. Unfortunately, those are things that are often uh, purchased a lot by poor people. And so if you, the government just merely tried to tax those things, um, it would not be a very progressive tax policy. In the inelastic supply, the classic example is land. I mean, you know, you're not going to take land off the market just because it's being taxed, and additional land doesn't come on the market uh, because of taxes. Although it's it's hard to have a pure land tax because a lot of the value of land will be the improvements on the land, that is, you know, the buildings and so on. Um, so a pure, but if you could come up with a pure land tax, that would be something that's inelastic. And in fact, that has a distinguished history. Uh, the economist Henry George said we should fund all of government with a land tax. It was the single tax uh, proposal and it was popular back in its back when he first proposed it although it never uh, it it didn't get implemented it was there were some there was a georgist movement to uh, have a single tax on land and again the theory being that here is this thing that's in inelastic supply you're not going to uh, <coughs> if you had a pure land tax and I'm not actually sure how to make it practical to make it a pure land tax but if you could 
then the you wouldn't be affecting the quantity of anything and if you don't affect the quantity of anything there's no dead weight loss and so you get um, you, you get your tax revenue without the loss of, of consumers and producers surplus but uh, more generally it doesn't work that way and we do get these losses of like this triangle of uh, FIG in the uh, in the example and so that's it on taxes and surplus.